Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. So today on the sacred occasion of Janmashtami, I feel blessed to be here among all of you. And I will speak today on how Krishna descends to make the two lives of the gopis one and how he helps us to make our two lives one. So I will take this in three broad parts. First part I will talk about the speciality of Krishna's relationship with the gopis, the Madhurya Parakya Bhav. And the second part I will talk about how that mood is relevant for us in today's world, in our life as sadhakas. And then lastly, how Krishna unites with the gopis and how we can also unite with Krishna. So this is one of the most one of the most seminal verses. Just as when the semen a whole person comes. So from this verse, uh, Bilva Mangal Thakur has got the inspiration to compose the Govinda Dhamo Stotra. And that whole Govinda Dhamo Sotra is a set of beautiful verses, all of them end with this chorus. Govinda Dhamo Dharma Dhaveti. So Bilva Mangal Thakur there is envisioning how different devotees across time and space in different universes and different kalpas, when they faced distress, when they faced challenges, at that time they called out helplessly to Krishna. And that is modeled on this situation in Vrindavan. So what is happening over here? Krishna is leaving Vrindavan. And the gopis are afflicted, mortified, devastated at the prospect of Krishna's departure. And they have done everything possible. They prayed to the gods, please send some storms. They prayed to the elements, please obstruct Krishna's departure in some way. They begged to the Brajavasi, stop Krishna from going. And now finally, when Krishna is about to depart, one of the most iconic scenes from Krishna Leela, from Krishna's, especially Krishna's Madhuri Leela, where the, go, where the gopis lay down in front of Krishna's chariot, saying, Krishna, if you're going to go, go over our hearts and bodies. We can't live without you. So, you are going to take away our life by departing, so take away our life physically also. So that, one of the most moving moments of Krishna's Rajabila is about to unfold. But if before that, after the gopis have tried everything else, then it is their situation that is described in this verse. Evam bruvana virahatura brisham virahatura They were immensely afflicted by the agony of imminent separation from Krishna, Brusham, it was unbearable. And then in Bruvana, they had been talking, what could we do? There's nothing we can do. Prajastriya Krishna Vishaktamanasaha Vishaktamanasaha Asakta is attached, Vishakta is very strongly attached, Vishesha Rupena Asakti, very strong attachment they had to Krishna. And who are they? Prajas, Triyaha, they are the ladies of Vrindavan. And then finally what they did, what have they done? Visrujya Lajjam, they put away their, the word Lajja can in one context mean shame, in another context it can mean shyness. So in this case, because it was a traditional society, there were no public displays of affection. So the gopis, although they loved Krishna, their meetings with Krishna, their rendezvous with Krishna were in private. Maybe in the forest of Vrindavan when Krishna would perform Ras Dila, or when they had gone out, Krishna had gone out, they would meet each other. In public, in front of everyone, in front of their elders, they would not exhibit their affection to Krishna. They were deferential 
to the culture at that time. But here they felt if Krishna goes away, what is the point of our living? And therefore, this with Jalajam, or the love which they had kept concealed because of social considerations, now they forgot the social considerations and they publicly proclaiming Krishna, the love for Krishna. How? Rurudus Masuswaram, crying out loudly, although it's loud. Now, su swaram means with melody. Swara is melody. But it was not just with melody, it was with intensity. They are fervently calling out to Krishna. Govinda Dharma Dharma Oh Govinda, oh you who are the lord of our senses. If you go, you are the giver of happiness. How will we live without you, O Krishna? O Madhava, you are the lord of the goddess of fortune. You bring fortune in everyone's life. How can you subject us to this misfortune? O Damodara, you are bound by the love of your devotees. Are you spurning us? Are you abandoning us? Are you rejecting our love and going away? How can you leave us like this? They are fervently begging to Krishna. And yet, Krishna departs. He departs not rejecting their love, but acknowledging their love. He gets off his chariot and he promises them, I will soon come back. I will soon come back. And that promise is what keeps the life of the Vrajavasi is going. Radharani in a beautiful prayer quoted in the Chaitanya Chartam which states that, O oh Krishna, when you left us and went away, you set our whole life on fire. Virahatura. The fire of separation constantly burned our bodies, our hearts. So she says, my plight Oh, Krishna is like that of an animal who is caught in a cage which is on fire. Now, normally if an animal is in such a cage, it will try to break and run away. Says Krishna, when you departed, you set this cage on fire. But by your promise that you will come back, you bolted the door of that cage. What does that mean? That because you will come back, without you, we can't live, O oh Krishna. But, O oh Krishna, if you come back, we want to be there to serve you. So although the fire of separation from you is burning us, we cannot leave you. We cannot, we cannot let go of our lives. We cannot cast aside our bodies. So we are in this body, we are living, but we are burning constantly. Now why would Krishna do anything like this? There are, why would Krishna subject his devotees to such, uh, such painful separation? Now there is an external reason, there is an internal reason. The external reason of course is that Krishna had come to the world to do multiple things. One of them was Vinashaya Chadushkrita. He had come to destroy the demoniac people. And the demoniac were spread all over Bharatvarsha. And Krishna didn't want them to come and attack Vrindavan. If you see, many demons came to Vrindavan. But the, most of those demons were like wizards and the fighting between them and Krishna was very playful. There were no weapons used. And either, but when outside the real wars would take place, there would be weapons, there would be casualties. Krishna didn't want Vrindavan to exhibit, experience all that. So Krishna wanted to fulfill his mission. And the beautiful setting of Vrindavan would be affected adversely if there is brutal fighting. 
in Vrindavan, Krishna's killing of the demons is also very playful. Without much effort, without using any weapons. Like a child playing games and breaking dolls, Krishna brings down these terrible demons. So Krishna wanted to fulfill his purpose of Dharma Vinashaya Chidushkritam. That is one reason, but it is more of an external reason. The inner reason was that Krishna wanted to heighten the love of the gopis. That <coughs> Krishna wanted their love to become more and more intense because of the separation. In fact, for that separation itself to be intensified, the whole of the such setting of Raja is accordingly demonstrated. That means that if you see the gopis are with Krishna in the Parakiras. Now Parakiras means that they are not duly wedded to Krishna. In fact, there are different kinds of gopis, but many of the gopis are wedded to someone else. So Radharani is wedded to a gopa named, does anyone know his name? Sorry? Yeah, Abhimanyu. So this is not Arjuna's son Abhimanyu. This is entirely different. This has the same name. And he's a Gopa, of course. Now, internally speaking, that Abhimanyu is also a, an expansion of the shadow of Krishna. But the purpose of this is something very deep. Love is best experienced and expressed when there is opposition. Now, people can say to anyone else, you know, I love you, I love you. The words are cheap. But when difficulties come, at that time, love is tested. Basically, love is tested in two ways. What can you do for the beloved? And what can you give up for the beloved? This is what I am ready to do up for you. And this is what I am ready to stop doing for you. So now, uh, when there is opposition, when there is something which is difficult to do, something either difficult to do as a loving offering or something which is difficult to give up, at that time, that love becomes demonstrated. Now, every mother, every parent may say they love their child. But then, if their child is in the ring, has a, some life-threatening disease, and then they may be ready to give up their own bodily part to save the life of the child. So that is love. So the idea that love can exist outside of sacrifice is a dangerous lie. The idea that love, the very essence of love is sacrifice. That means we sacrifice our interests for the interests of the person who we love. And there can be many things which can be sacrificed. Uh, one basic level we show is that if we give our time to someone, that is also a way of expressing affection. We give our money to someone. We give our wisdom or guidance or as practical assistance to someone. So that is also expression of love. But Krishna, what is he doing? As I said, love is experienced and expressed more when there is opposition. So an example could be, if a baby elephant is growing. Now the elephant itself as it is growing, it may not know how strong it is. But suppose there is a she elephant or there are some delicious fruits which are nearby. And this elephant is tied to a tree. And in the childhood the elephant had tried to break free from the tree and couldn't break. But now it sees those fruits, wants to rush towards them. And then, it starts rushing, it, when the obstacles come, oh, it's tied to the tree. And it pulls with all its strength and this big tall tree starts bending, starts toppling. Wow, everybody is impressed, oh, this small baby elephant has so much strength. And sometimes the elephant itself might be surprised, oh, I can do this, I didn't know. So, the strength is experienced internally and expressed externally when there is opposition. 
So similarly, the strength of the love is also is also expressed in expressed externally and experienced internally when there is opposition. And that opposition which is set up for the gopis in Vrindavan is through the arrangement of the parkiras. Because the gopis and Krishna are not duly wed husband and wife, so they have to endeavor especially to meet. They cannot meet very easily, naturally. There are many obstacles that come. Now, this might seem immoral. If gopis are married to someone else, how can they meet with Krishna? But actually, there is immoral, there is moral, and there is transmoral. Transmoral means it is above morality. Because Krishna is all pure. And everything that he does is actually pure. And but the point over here is sometimes say all of us when we want to come to God, live a pure life, we have to give up the bad. We might have some bad habits which we have to give up. Now giving up the bad is one sacrifice it needs to be done. But sometimes we may have to give up the good also for God. And that is a bigger sacrifice. So for a woman, and especially for a woman in a traditional society, her chastity, and not just her chastity, the reputation of her chastity, they are extremely important. And what the gopis demonstrate is that they are ready to sacrifice even that for Krishna's sake. When Krishna plays the flute and calls the gopis, at that time, they just Pati Sutanvaya Bratra Bandhavan Ati Vilangyate Antya Achyutagata Gati Vidastava Udgita Mohita Kitava Yoshita Kastya Jinnishi so the gopis are saying to Krishna in the Gopi Gita, Krishna, we give up everyone for you. Pati Sutanvaya Bratra Bandhavan. Our children, our partners, our, our husbands, our brothers, our parents, they all opposed us and we gave it all up to come to you. Why? Tava Udgita Mohitaha. By the sound of your flute, we were so captivated. Udgita. Now normally, if we want to appreciate music, say, there's one, somebody does a wonderful kirtan. And then they ask, how was the kirtan? And they say, it was loud. And loud. Now loud is not a particular appreciation, isn't it? So, we would say melodious. And especially if somebody is playing a flute, the flute sound is not loud. But, for the gopis, when Krishna plays a flute, then that is the loudest sound in all of existence. They can't hear anything else. Just like a mother has a small baby, and the mother is doing some work in the kitchen, and maybe some phone call has come, somebody else is talking. But if in the other room she hears the baby, maybe a small whimper, a little cry, nobody else will hear it. But if the mother hears it, she will stop hearing everything else. Oh, what has happened to my baby? So, when there is love, even the smallest sound from the beloved is heard very loudly. And when there is no love, when there is aversion, then even the loudest scream, nothing is heard. Because the whole filter has come over there. But the point is for the gopis, when Krishna played the flute, Tava Udgita Mohitaha. That Krishna, they came toward Krishna because they were captivated. It is said that Krishna's flute sound, Krishna through his heart, when he sang, played the flute, it was the love of his heart coming out through his lips, through the holes of the flute, moving across Vrindavan and falling like a rope on the hearts of the gopis and just tugged them. They just had to come. 
and when they had to come they had to reject everyone else in the family for that and that meant that they that's kind of society and the gopis would leave everything and come whether they would be accepted back in their family afterwards they didn't know that but they were ready for it krishna says in the bhagavad gita in the conclusion sarva dharman parityajya mahamekam sharanam raja says give up everything for my sake it's interesting he uses the word sarva dharman parityajya that even dharma has to be given up for the para dharma for the supreme dharma of devotion to krishna of pure devotion i was once at a uh, at a gita jayanti program organized by some hindus and they had their children reciting the gita verses so they came to they recited some of the verses and they came to this verse and they all all the kids recited sarva adharman parityajya mame kam sharanam raja aham tvam sarva papebhyo mokshayishami ma shucha so is something wrong did you hear something wrong adharman so then afterwards i asked the organizers if the verse is dharman parityajya why did you say adharman so he quoted some gita commentator he said actually krishna has come to establish dharma dharma samsthapana arta so how can krishna tell anyone to give up dharma so this commentator's theory is that long ago when the gita was being replicated in the past there was no printing press so people would hand write to transmit the scripture so there was a what is called a pathantara bhed that when you write it from this copy to this copy sometimes some word gets left out so says see he so his theory was that originally it is adharman parityajya but somebody forgot the a so now we are putting the a back <laughs> so actually now this might seem to be a logical understanding yeah krishna is coming to establish dharma why will he tell us to give up dharma but it is not contextually appropriate because for arjuna there is no question of adharma it was should i follow my kshatriya dharma and fight against the aggressors or should i follow my kula dharma which is i should protect the people of my dynasty so there was a dharma a conflict of dharma uh, and at that time there is dharma sangram conflict of dharma and he didn't know what to do so krishna told him at that time just forget about dharma and focus on the purpose of dharma that is to serve me and then do that which will help me to serve you so the, this is the exam this was sarva dharman parityajya is indicative of what that even the good may have to be given up for the best so the gopi is for them to be dutiful wives that is good it's important for uh, the maintenance of society that there will be matrimonial integrity but for the best even the good can be given up and this parkira without the parkiras the the level of the love of the gopis where they are ready to give up even that which is the most treasured for a woman that would not have been demonstrated so this per the setting of the parkiras is done primarily to demonstrate the love of the gopis for krishna to the whole world now at the same time so the bhagavatam at one level it inspires us to transcend dharma but on another level it also en- it does not encourage rejection of dharma so that's why at one level it is said by the arrangement of the yoga maya uh, by uh, that although the family members of krishna saw of the gopi saw the gopi is living running toward krishna but then when after the rasalila krishna uh, the gopis came back it is said in the bhagavatam that their, their husband and family members didn't held, hold it against them because what had happened yoga maya had arranged the expansions of those gopis to be there so that they all felt the gopis could not go they wanted to go but they could not go so yoga maya arranged everything yoga maya arranged their memory to be obscured and these gopis expansions to be manifested so that so at one level dharma is to be preserved at another level dharma is to be transcended so the parkiras demonstrates 
the extent of the sacrificing spirit of the gopis. Now, if we don't have this understanding that the gopis are exalted devotees, Krishna is God, then we will mistake the transmoral to be immoral. But the gopis are exalted devotees. In fact, many of them are great sages. Many of them are very, very evolved souls. Some of them, of course, are eternal associates of Krishna. But interestingly, in this same verse, further, the gopis are saying, Krishna, we left everything to come to you. And then what have you done? Kastya Jainishi. How can you abandon us and go away? And that too at night. The gopis have come to Krishna at night and saying that Krishna in the Ras Leela suddenly disappeared. So Kastya Jainishi. Even an ordinary man would not leave a woman alone at night. What to speak of somebody who is supposed to be a Kshatriya, who is a protector of others. And that too in the middle of a forest. How can you do this Krishna to us? Kastya Jainishi. So actually, you know, Krishna, he works in many different ways to increase the love of the devotees for us, for him. So at one level, so as I said, love means showing by what we are ready to give up for Krishna and what we are ready to do for Krishna. So the gopis are ready to give up the world for Krishna. But when they come to Krishna and Krishna gives them up, now at that time, there is every reason to reject Krishna. Krishna, we did so much for you and you are abandoning us. But the gopis don't do that. And, and Vishnu <coughs> Pitama says in the Dharma Shastra that, in his, uh, the Mahabharata says that, how do you know that love, love is real, love is deep? He says, when there is every reason for that loving bond to be broken and it doesn't break. That is extremely deep love. That is the supreme love. So normally if somebody with whom we have a loving relationship, if they rebuff us, they reject us, they insult us, they do so many things to us. And we feel like, you know, if you are doing like this, why should I continue? But it is one thing to what are we ready to give up for the beloved. But if the beloved doesn't reciprocate, in fact the beloved seems to do the opposite of reciprocating. Instead of reciprocating, Krishna is rejecting them and going away. And still they maintain the love for Krishna. That means this love is so great that they love Krishna not only because of Krishna, but they love Krishna in spite of Krishna. <laughs> that means that Krishna, even if you don't reciprocate with me, still I love you. And this is the mood of the last verse of the Shikshashtakam. Ashlishyava padaratam pinashtumam Adarshanam marmahatam karotuva Yathatathava vidhatulam pato Mat prananathas you and you alone, O Krishna, are my pranamath. And the Gaudiya talking, this is Krishna, this is like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu speaking in the mood of Radharani. He says, You embrace me with love, or you trample over me and just go away. And it's one thing if we love someone and they don't reciprocate. That's bad enough. But if they leave us and go to someone else, that is even worse. So, lack of reciprocation is what? Rejection is worse. But replacement seems to be unbearable. But what the gopis are saying? Mar mahatam karotuva. Even if you are a lumpata, you leave me and go away to someone else. Still, mat prana nathas tu saeva nampara. There is no one who is my lord except you. This, so the whole setting of Vrindavan is meant to demonstrate the unconditional nature of the gopis' love for Krishna. That Krishna, even if we have to lose everything for you, and then apparently we lose you also. It's one thing to lose everything for the object of love, 
but then to lose the object of love and then still to maintain love that is an unpre unparalleled unprecedented even an unimaginable level of love and that is the love of the gopis for krishna and to demonstrate this love this zenith you cannot imagine love higher than this that is to demonstrate that to the world krishna leaves vrindavan and goes away krishna leaves vrindavan and he goes away so that the world can know how utterly selfless and unconditional the gopis love for him is so this was the first part uh, about how the love of the gopis the second and third will be shorter hopefully <laughs> but in the second part primarily i talk about how, what does this mean for all of us a uh, simple over simplified way of looking at it is oh all this is just too exalted there are multiple different ways of looking at it this is too exalted we should not even think about it or start we can't understand this yes it's true we can't trespass into it but this is the what we aspire for so we need to try to understand it some people who are just critical they may say this is immoral and you're trying to rationalize it all no if we see who are the people discussing this if it's simply immoral then why would parikshit maharaj who has given up his kingdom and shukdev goswami who had never had any attachment to anything material why would they be discussing something immoral something merely sensuous at all so this is trans moral but the point is it is also relevant for all of us in a different way see after krishna left vrindavan the gopis and even when krishna was in vrindavan the gopis almost had two lives they had their lives according to their roles in vrindavan or they were members of a particular family and they had their responsibilities over there and in their hearts they had their life with krishna and whenever they got an opportunity they would use their opportunity to be with krishna so of course the gopis level of love is very high but we all when we are practicing bhakti in the material world we also have two lives we have our material life we have a family we have a profession we have our social obligations and even if we are devoted to krishna even if somebody who is say in the somebody is a renounced order still they have to also function in the world practically and internally we would just love to be with krishna we just love to be practicing bhakti constantly and not to anything else but we have these two lives we have the outer life according to our roles in this world and we want the inner life where we are absorbed in love for krishna in fact chaitanya mahaprabhu uses this very metaphor in the chaitanya charitamrita when he talks about how say for example rupa and sanatan goswami or agnatha goswami when they wanted to renounce the world and they saying we are entangled over here chaitanya mahaprabhu says give the same example of the situation of the gopis he said just as if a woman has a relationship with some man other than her wife she will be very diligent in her home duties so that nobody will suspect but in her heart she will be thinking of her lover and whenever she gets an opportunity she will be there now we might say that actually you know to give to talk about bhakti and love for krishna why would such a scandalous kind of example be given obviously chaitanya mahaprabhu was so renounced that there is no uh, there is no immorality within him and he is definitely not recommending immorality but the principle over there is to be understood it's a provocative example but the whole mood of vrindavan is modeled on this example or this example is modeled on that mood of vrindavan the gopik so what chaitanya mahaprabhu is telling rupa sanatan goswami is that you have your life they, they were ministers in at that time in a government that was quite aggressively anti dharmic nawab husain shah was one of the most tyrannical muslim rulers in india and yet they were there playing their roles living accordingly but what chaitanya mahaprabhu said them is do your roles and do them well but in your heart stay devoted to krishna so all so what the gopis have to do 
that we also in many ways have to do. Now we, the gopis had their external roles which they had to perform. So we also have to do our roles. But in our hearts, we want to be connected with Krishna. We want to be absorbed in Krishna. Of course, the gopis naturally had love for Krishna, so they could do it easily. For us, we have to conscientiously cultivate that love. And that's why we have sadhana bhakti, that's why we have festivals like Janmashtami, where we put aside everything else and focus directly on Krishna. So that by such occasions, when we hear about Krishna, when we behold the beautiful darshan of Krishna, when we sing about Krishna, our bhakti lata beach gets nourished. That our love for Krishna becomes strengthened. The bhakti tradition explains that love and separation have a very dynamic relationship between them. So we could say that is the relationship of forest and wind. Separation does to love what the wind does to fire. I was a few months ago in California and there was one of the worst forest fires that have broken out over there. There was a place, very scenic, beautiful retirement place called Paradise. And it was practically burned down. So Paradise, they were saying, turned into hell over there because of that fire. So when this one of, uh, there's a, so one of the persons who was involved over there in the firefighting operations, he was saying that at that time, the worst thing that can happen when there is a fire is wind comes. The wind will spread the fire. So separation does to love what wind does to fire. That the, just as wind spreads the fire, separation intensifies the love. When the gopis are separated from Krishna, they are constantly thinking about Krishna. But similarly for all of us, we may want to read about Krishna, hear about Krishna, but we have so many other things to do. Because if we can't hear and read about Krishna, we can't come to the temple, we can't do our so much seva. But if we are longing to do that, then if we, that longing is strong, that longing will purify us. So this principle, for the gopis, they don't have to be purified. It is rather their love is to be glorified by Krishna. And the setting is created for that. But this Krishna appearing and disappearing, leaving for a long time, this dynamic is there at the sadha, siddha level for the gopis and it is also at the sadhaka level as demonstrated in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam for Narad Muni. Narad Muni, when he is Narada boy in his previous life, he performs meditation and he sees the Lord appear over there and he is delighted. Every one of his senses is enlivened by seeing the Lord. And as he is meditating, suddenly the Lord disappears. It's like say after a whole day of fasting today, maybe at night we have a delicious feast and we are savouring the feast. You know, there may be some, there's some delicious sweet is there. Maybe Shrikhand or whatever, and we are eating it. And we close our eyes to savor it. And then we put our hand down, and there's nothing there. We look, the plate has disappeared. Hey, what happened? Where did my plate go? Yeah, if we're desperately hungry and the food disappears, it would be wild. So Narad Muni is like that. He's relishing the Lord's presence with all his senses, with all his whole heart. And suddenly the Lord disappears. He frantically searches around, he frantically sits down and tries to meditate. But he can't get the Lord to appear again. And then the Lord says, you are not yet pure enough. He says, because you are incomplete in service and impure at heart. Right now, the Lord actually says very sweetly, I regret that you won't be able to see me again. So then, but he says, I gave you this glimpse so that it will create a longing for me within you. And that longing for me will drive out all cravings for the world from your heart. So when we come to festivals like these, we want to immerse our consciousness as much as possible in Krishna. And that immersion of our consciousness will create longings for him. And when this longing is there, the longing for Krishna will cause all our worldly cravings to get dissipated. 
So separation does to love what wind does to fire. So we all because of the two lives that we have, because we can't always be with Krishna, we have to do so many other things. But when we are with Krishna, if we cultivate an intense absorption in Krishna, then that longing will gradually purify us of all cravings. Now, of course, you know, we cannot simply say that, oh, I want to long to come to the temple, so I will not come to the temple, then my longing will increase. No, that won't work. In the same dynamic, separation does to love what wind does to fire. Now, if the fire is big, the wind will spread it. But if the fire is a small candle, <laughs> if the wind comes, it will extinguish it. So, we can't presume our love for Krishna is like a forest fire. Is it? Our love for Krishna may well be like a candle. And that's why we need to regularly come in association. So, we all have to find out what is the optimal balance. If we are constantly with devotees, constantly doing services, we may start taking it for granted. So, some separation is helpful. But too much separation means you will just get caught in the world and we will forget Krishna. So, it will become like the wind of separation will extinguish the fire of the, the candle flame of our devotion. So basically, the two lives of the gopis mirror the two lives that we need to live in this world. Of course, the level of consciousness is very different. The gopis are spontaneously absorbed in Krishna. We need to cult conscientiously cultivate absorption in Krishna. But this is there is a mirroring effect over there. And whenever we are unable to be with Krishna, if we can cultivate that longing, that longing will purify us. That is the second part of how this all relates with us. The last part will be how Krishna made the two lives of the gopis one and how you can do it for us also. So the Gopal Champu is a beautiful book. It's a literary masterpiece written by Jiva Goswami. And therein he, there's a, it's, it's an amazing book of, uh, there is artistry, there is scholarship, there is bhava, devotion, is all combined together. So, Champu is a particular form of literature in which normally if you consider literature there are two forms, there is prose and poetry. So, Champu was a, is a particular form of literature where prose and poetry are combined together. And it's not just a random combination, whenever I think I will use, a, I will compose words, whenever I like, I will compose text. No, there are rules for that. So, that's why if you read the Gopal Champu, you read the verses, there will be two numbers. One is the number according to the prose and then another is the number according to the poetry. So, in Gopal Champu, Jiva Goswami draws from various scriptures to demonstrate, to explain how the gopis are reunited with Krishna. How Krishna honors his promise to come back to Vrindavan. So he describes that when Krishna comes, uh, there is a demon, Shishupal, and there is another demon who is Jaya and Vijaya manifested in this world. And Krishna is who is the other demon? Dantabakra, yes. So now when Krishna is to kill Dantabakra, actually he comes to the area of Mathura. Because that's where, in that area where Nantavakra is wrecking havoc and Krishna kills him. And after Krishna kills him, Jiva Goswami describes, Krishna Pila comes so close to Vrindavan now, let me go back. And then he puts down his weapons in the Jamuna and he comes out after bathing. Actually it is after this the Kurukshetra war takes place. So at that time when Krishna comes back to Vrindavan, Krishna says, now I have completed my mission, the demons I have killed. Now I will not lift up any weapons again. And that is another reason why in the Kurukshetra war, Krishna does not lift any weapons. Because he has returned to Vrindavan. So he comes back to Vrindavan and the Vrajuvas is delighted to have Krishna back. And Krishna has come in a magnificent chariot. After all, he is a Yadu, he is Dwarka. He is the Dwarka, not the official king of Dwarka, but he is the most powerful person in Dwarka. He is royalty. And at that time, when the Brajvasis, they are delighted to see Krishna there. 
and then still Nanda Maharaj and uh, Yashoda when they're talking with Krishna they're repeatedly looking at the chariot why because many decades ago it was a chariot that came and took away their heart and life Akrurayane that it was in the chariot of Akrura that Krishna went away so as long as that chariot is still there the Yashoda the Vajivasis are thinking Krishna may go away at any moment and Krishna assures them that actually this chariot will not go away, never go away. So this chariot is here to serve your wishes, not to shatter your hearts. And then the Vrajivasi is, Nandama is saying, Krishna, if you are here for real, then don't just stay over here, settle down over here. Settle down means, he says, get married to the gopis. And Krishna agrees. Now there are some gopis. It is interesting that many of you know that the gopis performed a Vrata to Katyani. Hmm? Now it's interesting in those uh, Anandandavan Champu and Gopal Champu, Kavikarana Puranji Goswami, they say that among the gopis who performed that Vrata, Radharani was not there. Those were, go those were they had prayed to Katyani and they waited. So all along, despite all their family's persuasions, pushings, they had remained unmarried, waiting for Krishna to come back. And so because these gopis were unmarried, so uh, the Vrajivasis decided to form, to have Krishna married to those gopis. <laughs> At that time there was polygamy and Krishna of course is the lord of everyone, so he can maintain everyone. But then there is Pauranamasi. Pauranamasi is the grandmother of Madhumangal. Mm -hmm. Madhumangal is a Brahmana and he is like the, you could say, the humorist in Krishna Lila. He does many funny things. Now, Pauranamasi is very wise. And Pauranamasi, she comes to know and she, she is the, practically the only old, old, old person in the But she is not old in the sense of weak, she is the old in the sense of wise. And the Vrajivasis, they have their Brahmanas whom they consult. But Pauranamasi is like their own Brahmin. Listen that? She is from their community almost. She is a Brahmin, but she is very close to the Vrajivasis. So if Pauranamasi comes to know that, oh, Krishna is getting married. It seems almost when people come to a particular age, you know, maybe 45, 50, 55, it's, I've seen in every community, it seems the elders start getting caught in matchmaking. He said, you know, okay, this person, this person, this person, this person. So it's uh, their own match is over now, but they have to look back some other matches now. <laughs> so now as soon as Pornamasi comes to know that okay, Krishna is going to get married. He says that. I think she comes immediately and they are all very happy to see her. And he says, Who is Krishna marrying? And they tell the list of all the gopis. And Pavanamasi looks at them very strange. Where is Radha? Nobody loves Krishna like Radha. Now, Pavanamasi is older to her, so she doesn't use the word Radha Rani. She just uses the word Radha. So, where is Radha over here? And the Vrajivasi is in the Maharaj Yashoda. She said, It would have been a dream come true if Radha would marry Krishna. But how can it happen? Radha is already married. But you also know that. So the very fact that you are asking this question means you have something in mind. Is what do you have in mind? So that hope which we had long ago abandoned as impossible, your words have triggered a spark of that hope. Please tell us what do you have in mind? So, Pavanamasi says, I will take care of everything. If Krishna is to be married, he must be married to Radha. He must be married to the gopis who love him the most. And she says, call everybody of Vrindavan in the main assembly of Vrindavan. We will have a grand assembly for everyone to come. And when they hear this news, that evening everybody comes over there. And when everybody is there at that time, 
the people, now many of them, what happens? Generally, if this kind of assembly primal, the men come first. So maybe something is to be discussed. And the women come gradually. So the men, the elders in the family have come. And now the gopis, who are Krishna's gopis, who are like wedded wives in their houses. So those gopis are at home. They're young, they're not involved so much in the social affairs. It's older people who are involved in the overall social affairs. So they are at home and, and everybody is assembled. The Pauramasi signals with her hand. And right behind her, all the gopis appear over there. And everybody is stunned. See, you know, all these gopis are in our homes. What are they doing over here? So they are, they are puzzled. And seeing them puzzled, Pauramasi says, Go back and see if the gopis are there in your homes. They run back to their homes and they see all those gopis are there. They say, what's going on? Did you run back faster and come over here first? No, oh, this is something, something strange going on. So they were about to come back, but they decide, you come with us now. Now this has happened earlier with Brahma also. Now Brahma, he had taken away all the gopas and they had, he had put them to sleep. And then he saw all the gopas are still here. But because he had put them to sleep, he couldn't wake them up immediately. So he was going there, coming back. He, he couldn't get the gopas to meet these gopas. But here, the, the Vrajivasi said, let's get the gopis. And then they got the gopis. And when they got the gopis, all the gopis came over there and right in front of everyone, they saw that there are two gopis. There's one Radha here, one Radha here. One Lalita here, who whom Purnamasi has produced, Purnamani has manifested, she has revealed their, her presence and there is one Lalita over here, there is one Vishaka here, one Vishaka over here, there is one Champaklata here, one Champaklata there, one Tunga Vidya here, another Tunga Vidya there, one Sudevi here, one Sudevi there, one Rangadevi here, one Rangadevi there. I stand there, wonder struck, I said, what is going on? Paulamasi then smiles and she says, that, oh Brajivasis, I made this arrangement. I made this arrangement that Krishna's gopis are meant only for Krishna. And when the time of their marriage came up and Krishna was not there, so I arranged for all of them to be expanded. So it was their expansions which married the other men. The, the gopis originally are pure and untouched. And here Jiva Swami draws back. He says, huh, what was done in Ram Leela is done in a much more like, expanded way in Krishna Leela. In Ram Leela it is said, at one level Ravan abducted Sita. But at another level, Sita was safe with Agni Dev. And it was her expansion. It's called Maya Sita or Chaya Sita. That the illusory Sita, the shadow of Sita, that went with Ravana. So in that sense, Ravana, the real Sita, never touched, was never touched by Ravana. And if we can, we understand that these are actually the the gopis who were married to all the Vrajavasis. They were actually not the gopis of Krishna, they were the expansions of the gopis. Chaya means shadow. And we see this, now Abhimanyu, as I said, who is he? He is an expansion of the shadow of Krishna. So these are also expansion shadows. So it was what was required to be done for the purpose of the expansion of the Leela. That was done. Now for the progress of the Leela, the gopis were married. To Krishna, but it is not the gopis, the expansions of the gopis are there. And the real gopis were untouched by anyone else. And when Paramasi revealed this, oh, Nanda Maharaj Yashoda became jubilant. They said, Now Radha can marry Krishna. Now Radha can be united with Krishna once again. Or, not once again, once. Uh, they will be united forever. And everybody became jubilant. And thus, 
the krishna when krishna and eventually the elaborate description of gopal champu of how radha and krishna got married to each other and then that same chariot after the whole marriage after they performed wonderful leelas that that same chariot it came out of vrindavan and when it came to your jamuna that chariot expanded into two one chariot went by the jamuna to the spiritual world and all the prajivasis had ascended into that chariot and they all went to the spiritual world with krishna and the chariot another expansion of the chariot crossed the jamuna and that was the expansion of krishna on that chariot who came back and continued his leela on the earth went back and became a dwarka vasi but the point of this is that krishna did honor his word those who had given up everything for krishna krishna did not give them up permanently krishna gave them up long enough so that their love would manifest will would blaze forth much more and be manifest for the whole world to know but krishna fulfilled their love and same applies for all of us we have these two lives we have the life in the world and we have the life beyond the world as it is said be in the world but not of the world so now we do go on with our lives in the world and we do it as well as we can but our heart is with krishna and when the right time will come krishna will arrange for us to be fully reunited with him then if by practicing bhakti in the world in a mood of service to krishna if we can make our love for krishna more than our love for the world to be pure devotees means that we have no love other than krishna for to become pure devotees may take a long long time but if at least we become serious enough devotees that our love for krishna is more than our love for the world then we will be at the time of our death krishna will take us out of the world if we love the world more than him krishna will even against his will have to get us back to the world say if we love cricket more than krishna we go to the spiritual world and they will ask over there the gopal what is the cricket score <laughs> <laughs> that will not work if we are to be with krishna eternally and with those who love krishna if we don't love krishna we will be out of place over there so our love for krishna has to become more than our love for the world if that happens then krishna will take us to his abode and then we will be united so more who many people fear death because death means you go get up go away from your family members go away from your lo- loved ones but the dead body goes away from the home to the crematorium for devotees at the time of death devotees don't leave their home devotees go to their home we have a home in this world but this is a transitional home based on our roles it's important and we do it in a we do our responsibilities in this world in a mode of service but all our lives in a sense we are cultivating separation from krishna and through that separation there is intensification of our affection and at the time of death if our affection is strong enough then the body will perish but the soul will zoom up to be united with krishna just as the gopis were united with krishna and the chariot took them all to the spiritual world where they were forever with him similarly we will all be taken by krishna to his eternal abode so janmashtami on the sacred occasion when krishna appeared thousands of years ago in this world we can pray that that same lord appear in our hearts and become manifest more and more and attract our heart more and more so that our devotion for him increases and one day we become absorbed in him and thus we can attain him shri krishna bhagavan ki shri krishna janmashtami maha mahotsav ki so i'll quickly summarize what i spoke and then we can end the class i spoke on the theme of how krishna makes our two lives one by discussing how krishna made the two lives of the gopis one so the parkiras 
is the setting in Vrindavan which is created to, um, to demonstrate the extent of the gopi's love for Krishna. And in Vrindavan, normally we have to give up the good to get God. We have to give up the bad to come to God. But sometimes we may have to even give up the good. So the gopis are ready to give up their family members. And not just the family members, even their reputation of chastity. That is the most precious. They are ready to give that, even that up for Krishna. So it's like an elephant is tied. And how strong it is when it's pursuing uh, some food or eatables that is seen by that opposition. So the opposition in Rajalila demonstrates the magnitude of the love of the gopis for Krishna. Normally love is shown by what we are able to do, ready to do for someone and what we are ready to give up for that person. The gopis give up everything of the world for Krishna, including their reputation and dharma, apparently their reputation about dharma. But then even after that Krishna gives them up and goes away. But still, mat pranathas. The gopis' love is so great that even when there is no reciprocation apparently from Krishna, they continue to love. That is the zenith of love which the gopis demonstrate. And uh, Krishna, this this whole setting, there's an external reason why he leaves and down and goes away. That is to uh, destroy those who are destroying dharma. But the internal reason is to intensify the love of the gopis for him and to demonstrate that love for everyone. So separation does to wind, separation does to oh, love what wind does to fire. And then I talked about how all this applies to us. We also have to live two lives like the gopis were living. One is the social roles in Vrindavan and the other is the spiritual devotion to Krishna. So we have our professional family, social lives, but we also have our spiritual life. So if the time when we cannot be directly with Krishna, if that time we can cultivate longing for Krishna, then that longing will gradually cleanse us of our worldly cravings. But for that longing to be present, we need to be intensely present when we are present with Krishna. Taking in impressions of Krishna so that our spiritual attraction towards Him is kindled. Uh, if our love is like a candle, the wind of separation will extinguish it. But if we pursue our bhakti diligently, then we will by that practice of bhakti, be able to become free from our worldly cravings. And Krishna by his plan will link our lives together. So, this says Krishna came back to Vrindavan and married the gopis. So their inner and outer lives which were separate, they became one. And I discussed the past time from Gopal Champu, how Vaudamasi demonstrated that there were two sets of gopis. And Krishna's gopis were never touched by anyone, just as the real Sita was never touched by anyone. So, if we practice bhakti similarly, diligently, then at the time of death, it will be revealed that actually we were not touched by the world. That the world's hold will not be there on us. And we will attain Krishna. For devotees, if by the time of death our love for Krishna has become greater than our love for the world, then at death we won't leave home, but we will go home. And Janmashtami is a time when we can pray to Krishna that he manifest himself and that all attractiveness in our hearts by which we can become attracted to him and one day we can attain him. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Is there any time for questions? Does anyone have any questions? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Thank you so much for the class. So Prabhu, I have this question, you mentioned about the Ashni Shiva Padraka verse. So that mood can be maintained while uh, uh, serving the devotees? Okay. Can the Ashni Shiva Padraka mood be maintained while serving devotees? It depends. That means that it depends on what is the nature of that devotee, what is the nature of our relationship with that devotee. Nobody can be a substitute for Krishna. And Krishna's, Krishna is all attractive. By Krishna's grace, devotees can also be extraordinarily attractive. But we have to make sure that we are not artificial. See, we want to be, there's a difference between being disciplined and being artificial. Disciplined means that we don't feel a particular way right now, but we act as a matter of discipline that way. But artificial means there is not a, but in discipline, there is at least a desire for that kind of feeling. But it is not there. See, I, want to, I don't feel like chanting. I want to chant. Just don't feel like it. 
but artificial means you know externally i'm smiling and i'm offering obeisances and i'm moving my hand internally i'm cursing someone what a terrible person i have to do this so because if you're artificial it's unhealthy some amount of discipline is required so sometimes if with some devotees some things go wrong and the relationship gets is not so good it can be said that whatever happens i'll continue serving you well if you can do it with a genuine heart that is good but if you make that as a demand from our heart so that we can practice bhakti that is not healthy because sometimes the, what happens is we have a vertical relationship with krishna we have a horizontal relationship with devotees now of course devotees also krishna relates to us through his devotees also but sometimes one person can occupy our mind so much that then there is no space for krishna left over there so if we have had bitter interaction with someone some devotee then the negativity the resentment the anger all that is consuming our mind so much that we can't even think of krishna so then better keep a distance from that devotee and then serve krishna but definitely we want to serve devotees and if we can serve in this mood of uh, service attitude where we can try to approach towards an unconditional service attitude that's wonderful but if we can't we should not see that as a serious failure in our devotion to find whichever way we can serve and we can move on so that means we consider that i am here krishna is here and krishna's love comes to me through various devotees if it is coming through one particular devotee i should gratefully reciprocate but sometimes situations change and maybe that love is no longer coming through that devotee then rather than thinking i still have to reciprocate we should be respectful if somebody has done something for us we are always respectful and grateful but if that reciprocation is not happening that way we see from where is the reciprocation happening right now and we connect with krishna through that channel okay thank you any other questions yes what is it so the external situation is such that our internal longing for krishna gets decreased by that that's why we need association understanding association basically like minded association is extremely important bhakti anurag thakur says rupa goswami also says bhakti samad sindhu and like minded association basically means uh, that we need some devotees who understand our mind and who help us to understand our mind who understand our mind and who help us to understand our mind say if we are going through a particular relationship issue uh, and then if somebody who has never been to that that kind of issue say somebody has come from a very maybe a troubled upbringing and somebody has come from a very wonderful upbringing they don't even understand the kind of baggage we are carrying then they don't understand our mind is why are you so insecure why are you so sentimental why are you this why are that just just have faith in krishna now have faith in krishna is wonderful advice but it's very frustrating and disheartening for a devotee when they come with a practical problem and they are given a philosophical solution now practical problems also require practical understanding and practical suggestions so we we need to find in the devotee association those who can understand our mind and then that is okay you are feeling like this this is maya no no so that is no use speaking like that you know okay i am feeling like this this is how this is how i am feeling you know i cannot stop my feelings i cannot suppress my feelings i want to process them it's like feelings are uh, it's like say if somebody says i am feeling very cold it's not cold stop feeling cold what do you mean stop feeling cold i am feeling cold 
So isn't it? It's not a voluntary choice. So sometimes the situations that come in our life might affect us in some way and they may not affect somebody else in that same way and they say, why are you getting so troubled by this? But we are who we are. So we need some association that understands our mind. But not just that. They are, if they have gone through something similar, they can also, they not only understand our mind, but they help us to understand our mind. That means, yeah, this is a valid reaction, but this is an overreaction. See, what happens in every situation, there is an emotion that arises from the situation and there is an emotion that arises from the imagination that comes from the situation and the imagination that comes from the recollections that are triggered in us, from the impressions that are there already within us. So now, the situation has to be dealt with practically and the, imag the imagination has to be managed so that we don't get carried away by it. So, uh, what is the reality if somebody understands, then they can help us, okay, this is what you can do. But what is the mind's exaggeration, imagination? If they understand that, they will help us understand. Hey, you know, this is your mind trying to trick you here. So, if, if all our emotion is said like the trick of the mind, then that is, we will, we will feel completely ununderstood. But if all our emotion is considered as if it's genuine, then we will get swept away by our mind. So that's why we need association that helps us, that understands our mind, so that our emotions are acknowledged, and then helps us understand our mind, so that we won't get swept away by our emotions. And if we have that kind of understanding association, then yes, certain times, the same level of the practice of bhakti that we are, we are having at normal times might be difficult. So, it's like if you are going on the road, uh, driving. So, if the road is a lot of traffic, we may have to go slow. When the traffic clears, we will go faster. But sometimes, the traffic in our material life becomes very heavy. And that time, we cannot practice bhakti so much. So, we shouldn't reduce bhakti only to the successful performance of certain standards. Bhakti is also a matter of consciousness. I have a whole class on this topic that if we can't succeed in Krishna Consciousness, we can fail in Krishna Consciousness, not fail out of Krishna Consciousness. If we can't succeed in Krishna Consciousness means, oh I had decided I will come for satsang program, I will do this seva, I will do this much uh, sadhana, this, this, this. And it's good to have those goals and good to stick to those goals. But sometimes if we can't succeed in that, that doesn't mean our Krishna Consciousness is a failure. So to fail out of Krishna Consciousness means because I am not able to do this, 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 this so let me give up Krishna Consciousness. It's not practical for me. I am too fallen or this is too lofty or whatever. But to fail in Krishna Consciousness means Krishna, I still want to serve you. I still want to be your devotee. But this situation, this conditioning is obstructing me. So I am a fallen soul but still I want to serve you. And I will do what I can in this situation. So that way we won't let our situations completely take us away from our Krishna Consciousness. We may have to adjust certain things, but that is okay, that's just what life is. There is the Lila Amrit, it is described that when Prabhupada was in Allahabad, he, Prabhupada in his previous life was a pharmacist and there was a dispensary, so there was a doctor who would give the prescription and Prabhupada would actually fill the prescription and give the medication. So there is an interview of this doctor. And he says, it is clear that Abhay Babu, Prabhay Prabhupada was Abhay Babu at that time. So Abhay Babu was a very deeply religious person. But at that time, the main question in his mind was, how can I earn more money? Prabhupada had daughters to be married, one of his sons was very sick, he had family obligations, and he was concerned. And the Gaudiyama devotees at that time thought, why doesn't he move into the temple? You know, why is he just staying like an attached householder? Prabhupada is not attached. Prabhupada is responsive. Prabhupada is committed. So, if we have devotees who understand it, so for Prabhupada, his spiritual master understood it. He says, don't force him. He will do everything in his own time. So, Prabhupada had that faith. Prabhupada had that understanding from his spiritual master. So, when we are going through particular situations, we need to have some devotees who understand us and who help us understand our mind. Then we can go through those situations as is appropriate. So our purpose always remains the same, but our pace may vary. If we equate bhakti with a particular pace, 
not just a particular purpose. Then we start feeling that bhakti can't be practiced. If I have to go, I have to go at this speed only. No, sometimes you cannot go at that speed, but still you keep going in that direction. So bhakti is both, bhakti is not just about the pace, it is primarily about the purpose. And the pace can be varied according to situations. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. You were speaking about the internal and external and our external being our day to day lives and the internal being that I guess is direct connection with Krishna and our direct service. So I was just thinking, um, can you just elaborate a little bit more on if we see our external like day to day life, our responsibilities, our work, everything as also our service to Krishna, sometimes those external responsibilities can take up majority or a lot of our time that takes away from the internal. But what we can use as some sort of barometer or litmus test to assess when it's maybe those external responsibilities are kind of overwhelming us, uh, and like how we can, what criteria we may be able to use to kind of come back or um, help balance. Uh, that. Yeah. That's then the external become, that we can justify and say the we're doing more external because that's also our service, right? Yeah. And, so overwhelm us and then we get stagnant internally. Okay. So how can we ensure that our external doesn't overwhelm us so much? Because external also we may be doing as a service to Krishna. But then it can we can maybe be internally not nourished at all. How do we balance the two? What criteria can we have? It's difficult to have a universal criteria because each one of us is a particular psychophysical nature, each of us a particular situation. But broadly speaking, if you understand that bhakti is multi-level. We see Krishna talks about his multi-level bhakti from 12.8 to 12.12. 12.8 is Mayeva manadhat sumai buddhim niveshaya eva sishya mayeva atav dhomya samshaya Just be spontaneously absorbed in me you're with your mind and intelligence and Krishna doesn't say you will attain me. You are already living in me, Krishna says, if you do that. Then 12 lines says, if you can't do that, then Atha Chittam Samadhatam Nashaknu Simaistiram Abhyasa Yogi Vittomam Icchhaam Tamda Najjaya So then, if there is no spontaneous absorption me, then seeks conscientious absorption me. So our practice of sadhana bhakti, coming to temple, doing our japa, doing our puja, doing our swadhyaya, that is all conscientious absorption in Krishna. He says, if you can't do that, then there is, he says, Krishna says, work for me. Atahita Dapya Sattosi, Kartum Mad Yoga Mahashita, so like that Krishna goes on, I don't want to elaborate too much. But the point is, if just remember me spontaneously, remember me conscientiously, work for me or work for some good cause. Now within work for me also there can be two ways. Work for me can be direct, we come to temple and do some seva for Krishna. Or we work for our purpose, our job, but then our home and our life is devoted to Krishna. It's also indirectly working for Krishna according to our nature. But Krishna also includes work for some selfless cause, work for some cause beyond yourself. And Krishna says, by all these, you will come to me. Now, of course, when and how fast, that will vary. But the point is, bhakti is multi-level and bhakti is inclusive. So most of us, we would be somewhere between the second, third and fourth levels. The second is conscientious remembrance. Then there is the working for Krishna. And then there is working for some higher cause. So now, for all of us, we have to make sure that our growth is proportionate, not disproportionate. When we are living in the world, we want our service to grow. We may want to, want to grow professionally. We may want to grow financially. We may want to grow socially. I think through all this, I can serve Krishna more in future. Now it's true, we can if we are in a better position, but that growth has to be proportionate. Yudhishthir Maharaj is told by Narad Muni in the Mahabharata that there is dharma, artha and kama. Broadly we can correlate with dharma is like our temple and our bhakti, artha is like our job and kama is like our family responsibilities. So he says, don't pursue dharma at the expense of artha and kama. Don't pursue artha at the expense of dharma and kama. 
and don't pursue karma at the expense of dharma and artha. So he says, balance all the three together. So balance means that one thing should not stop the growth of other things. All of us were unicellular organisms at one time in our mother's womb. Now we have grown. So growth is natural to the living condition. But cancer is also growth. And cancer is the growth that is disproportionate and destructive. So if one thing starts consuming us so much, it starts destroying other aspects of our life. That is unhealthy. So we have to see whether the growth is proportionate or it is disproportionate. Just our, practically speaking, our service may take much more time than our sadhana. But if we have no, no consciousness left, left for sadhana at all, we have no taste left for sadhana, we have no inclination for sadhana. Some people may say that, oh, one day I want to give a huge donation to Krishna. I want to give 50%, 50, not 50%, 51% of my earnings to Krishna. But for that, now I have to work 16 hours a day. And I can't come to the temple, I can't come up with any programs. Well, it may happen that you grow that much, where you can give a phenomenal amount. But if you're not coming to the temple by that time, the desire to give will go away. So we have to make sure that there is one thing is we want to offer things to Krishna. But our purpose is primarily to offer ourselves to Krishna. And because we can't just offer ourselves to Krishna, we one way of offering ourselves to Krishna is by offering things to Krishna. So you know, the thoughts of money are always in our heart. We want to offer our heart to Krishna, but our heart is caught in so many things. So if we can't give our heart to Krishna, we give what is in our heart to Krishna. So we give some money to Krishna and by that, what happens? We give Krishna a place in our heart. But the point is not just to offer money to Krishna. The point is to use money as a tool to offer our heart to Krishna. So if I get so caught in, it could be pursuing money, it could be pursuing position, pursuing connections, pursuing resources for serving Krishna. See our, to conclude this answer, what I'll say is that, uh, we all, when we want to serve Krishna, that means basically we want to get more and more resources by which we can serve Krishna. So our desire for the resources should not overpower our desire for Krishna. The most important thing is we want to offer ourselves to Krishna. And if in pursuing the resources to offer to Krishna, we get so caught there that our desire to offer ourselves to Krishna itself goes away. Then that is unhealthy. So that is the overall, you could say, breaking point. That what we want for Krishna should not be wanted more than Krishna. What we want for Krishna, yeah, I want to build a big temple for Krishna. You know, I want to have a flourishing community for Krishna. But in pursuing that, if we give up Krishna itself, that is not healthy. Giving up Krishna means we get so obsessed by that. So most of our times we might be at the third level also, just serving Krishna. But it shouldn't lead to an aversion to the first and second levels. When the time is there, second level, conscientious remembrance of Krishna should also be there. So it's like we can connect with Krishna from here, from here, from here, from here also, from all the four levels. But we, when we are at that level, are we connecting with Krishna or are we going away from Krishna? That is what we need to carefully see. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay, yes, bro. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. I have two, uh, two questions. One is like, uh, how to overcome Maya and how to handle the fear? Yeah, they are long questions. But <coughs> overall, Maya comes in many ways. Fear is also one of the waves. So one simple point I would make is that, Sroto Ganastamaranam Bhajava Sudevam. The Bhagavatam says, that worldly desires and temptations, they come like waves. And if you are alone in an ocean, fighting the wave is very difficult. It's too strong, it will sweep us away. But if we can find an anchor, and we exercise our energy, not in not being swept away by the wave, but in holding on to the anchor. Even then the wave will shake us. But if you hold on to the held on to the anchor firmly, then we won't be swept away that much. 
So for us, we have to find out what can be our anchor. That means when desire starts sweeping us, fear starts sweeping us, how can we hold our consciousness to Krishna? It can be through the holy name, it can be through hearing some classes, it may be just coming and having darshan of Krishna, it can be through singing some bhajans. We have to find out what is the anchor that we can strongly hold on to. And then we keep that anchor readily accessible to us. So if we keep that anchor accessible, the waves we can't stop in the world. The waves will come and sweep us. But as long as we have the anchor to hold on to, we won't be swept away that much. Okay? Thank you. Let's go. So, how should we approach books like Gopal Champu or Nan Champu? With respect, but at the same time, it is our tradition. As for the authorized translations, yeah, it's tough because these are very complicated Sanskrit. So, Bhanu Maharaj has done a translation which is quite good. I was involved in editing that also, the English part, not the Sanskrit part. But um, it may not be entirely the Sanskrit because it's very complicated. In the 15th, 16th century, uh, Sanskrit had become very artistic and uh, intricate. So it's not so easy to translate that. But it's not that difficult because it's stories. The Sandarbhas are much more difficult to translate because it's very intricate reasoning and philosophy over there. But here it's primarily stories, so not... So, it, Manumaya's translations are fairly good. I think other devotees may also have done translations. We'll have to see each one merit. But this is our tradition and we all, if we have been for a few years in Krishna consciousness, if we have read Prabhupada's basic books and at least once we have read the Bhagavatam CC, then with the blessing of Srila Prabhupada and in parallel with what Srila Prabhupada has given us, we can read the previous Acharya's books because ultimately Prabhupada gave us the whole tradition of Krishna Bhakti. So, we don't want to bypass Prabhupada, but it is with still Prabhupada's blessings, we want to go. And in, in fact, Prabhupada, we want to go to the previous tradition also. In the first chapter of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada gives a whole list of commentaries in the Bhagavatam that should be studied by the serious student of the Bhagavatam. And he mentions there, not only our own traditions, he also mentions Vallava, who is some other tradition. So, Prabhupada really wanted us to go into the Bhagavatam deeply. And Gopal Champur and Anandana Champur are basically expansions of the Bhagavatam. So, we can read them. And while reading, there are certain sections which are esoteric, which talk about the intimate pastimes of Radha and Krishna. And for that, we can adopt the same approach as we approach, as we adopt with the Ras Leela. And Prabhupada has told that the Bhagavatam's purpose is very clear. Bhagavatam says, if you hear the Ras Leela, uh, the lust in your heart will go away. Vikriditam Rajavadridam Chavishnu Shaddhan Vitavana Shunyadatha Varana Yedya That if you hear this, Bhaktim Param Bhagavati Tilap Bhikamam Rudroga Mahashwa Pahinvante Chirena Dhiram That the last will go away from our hearts. But Prabhupada said if you read this and if you are getting agitated, then use your common sense, don't read it at that time. Just read other sections, they are quite very beautiful sections. The idea is that so this world is like the reflection and the uh, Krishna is the reality. So the male female attraction in the world is like the reflection. Radha Krishna attraction is the reality. So now if somebody sees a real mango, then they stop getting attracted to the false mango, the reflection of the mango. So like that if you understand the purity, the sublimity, the sweetness of Radha Krishna's love, then worldly attract captivations will go down for us. But that is only when we are convinced that is the real mango. And this is the, this is the reflection. But if you're not yet philosophically convinced about that, if you're not yet devotionally purified enough, then in, in fact for the absorbed devotees, what happens? Even the reflection reminds them of the reality. If they, Rupa Goswami in a prayer says that, yuvati yatha yuna, yuna yuvati yatha. Mano bhiramate tatra, mano me ramatam tvai. 
just as a young boy is attracted to young girl and young girl is attracted to young boy, let my heart be attracted to you, O Krishna. So what is happening for them? The reflection is reminding them of the reality. But for us, the reality might remind us of the reflection. <laughs> so we have to be careful. So esoteric sections within the scriptures, we need to uh, be cautious about reading them and see the effect and then decide whether we should read them or not. But the other sections we can read and we can read them through the guidance of Srila Prabhupada. So if we see something which is maybe different from what Prabhupada has said, we don't reject Prabhupada, but we try to find out senior Vaishnavas from whom we can reconcile things. But it can be very devotionally enriching if the previous Acharya's books are read with a proper service attitude. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have time now? Maybe, okay. Any lady, Vaishnavis have any questions? Okay. So one last question. Uh, quick question was, you mentioned about the importance of association. So, uh, if is there, I mean, our society is worldwide. So if uh, DOTC is okay, say for example, a temple in India, say Chopati temple or something, wonderful association. So does he leave his temple and join that temple or how, how to go about it? Okay. So if you feel that some other temple has wonderful associations, should we leave our temple and go to that temple? Mm. The There is the spiritual and there is the material. That means even our movement is spiritual, but it is the spiritual as manifested in the material world. So, to some extent, we bring our material mind, mind with us. And one characteristic of the material mind is, it always feels the grass is greener on the other side. So, yes, you could say objectively that maybe there are some, in some temples where there are many learned devotees, there are very wonderful classes given. And uh, yeah, you can get nourishment by that. But, it all varies. Uh, Yes, in, Chopa, in temples like Chopad, you might get to have senior, senior devotees and get a lot of association, a lot of hearing. But you might not get much room for doing service yourself. Somebody wants to themselves preach. It's like there are already so many preachers. You know, you will hardly get any opportunity to speak. So, uh, we have to see what our actual need is. Not just what our mind thinks will be wonderful. So sometimes some devotees just want to be in a big association with many senior devotees around them. And if that is what primarily gives them strength, then maybe going to a temple where that kind of setting is there might be helpful. There's no guarantee of that. But if ultimately our primary connection with Krishna for a long time is going to be our service to Krishna. And sometimes when in places where there are not so many senior devotees, not such a big congregation. Actually, if you want to take up responsibility, we can take up a lot of responsibility. And Prabhupada says that our spiritual advancement is proportional to the responsibility that we take in Krishna's service. Because we can do many services, okay, wash this plate, or you know, take this, serve this prasadam, all that is good, doing that. But somebody tells, now you are responsible for the serving of prasadam for the festival today. Then our mind won't be just absorbed at that time when we are serving the food before, after, so much absorption will be there. So we will grow not just by the quality of association that we get, but we will grow by the quality of responsibility that we take up. So we can see, where, even when we have good association, we have to be responsible to take that good association. If we don't do that, we will not be able to grow. So it's, it shouldn't be just a superficial craving that, oh, this temple is not good, let me go to that temple. In some situations, maybe changing temple might be required. But we shouldn't think that, oh, my spiritual life will be better just before I go to the temple. The whole principle of spiritual life is inner transformation. Mm -hmm. And unless we are committed to that inner transformation, no matter where we go, we will not benefit much. So rather than thinking of changing the temple where we are in, we can focus more on trying to take up more responsibility. And then if we take up more responsibility, even if you go to some other temple, we'll also be able to get more responsibility over there and do more service over there. So don't need to think primarily of changing. And nowadays with social media and internet available, even if you're at one place, we can hear classes from anywhere else. We can correspond with devotees also from different places if you want to. And physical barriers are not as limiting as they were earlier. Okay. 
थैंक यू सो श्री अंतराष्ट्रमद्भागवतम की श्री जन्माष्टमी महामहोत्सव की श्री कृष्ण भगवान की श्री प्रभुपाद की गौर भक्त की जय गौर प्रेमानंदे